anticipating a question in real time as things flow past, and it's nice. If you have one, I'll write them on the board. Uh, I have a question about the charge of columns. About the fourth paragraph at the beginning, what is the norm cost? Turn fourth paragraph, and what, was your, what is uh, a, norm, a null class? class. All right, somebody in here with a science background. Other questions? And some of these I'll answer like right away. Some of them I hope I can figure out how to sing and dance and answer them while I'm lecturing. You don't, you don't have to have questions, but if you do, who do you? I was just thinking that when I was reading these things, like it's kind of like advocating for kind of like a new way of morality, taking into consideration the idea of the commons and consumerism and all that stuff. But it really doesn't give you like a paradigm, like precise paradigm, like what would be that thinking? It's kind of like open-ended in a way. Well, the hardened piece you're talking about. Well, it's also these, the collapse piece too. Yeah. Like it, it, it just it just all you have these do they all kind of like scenario things in, but it really gives you like an alternate paradigm. So what are we gonna do about it? So okay, not focusing that much in consumerism, not focusing that much in appropriation, but it's like when we go back to talk about sustainability and everything, we always looking at eco economics and GDP and all that stuff. So, so in a way, everything that we value is based on economics. So I don't really think a, a changing on that paradigm. I mean, we all know about the tragedy of the economy. We all know about the collapse of civilization. We all know about the consumerism. Extreme consumerism is bad, but I don't really see any shifting in. And sustainability, I like the concept of sustainability, but it's just the same thing as environmental regulation, but without advocating more for the savings and the, 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 the altruistic aspect of it, but it's like not really altruistic because if you're advocating for savings, it will translate into money. So not really the externality, but more so the saving to the company. Quite sure how to turn all that into something I could write. To what, what is the alternate? The, what is the alternative? What's, yeah. So when we talk about what is the, the change? That, what is what is the out of all these readings? Basically, what are we going to do about it? I mean, if there's any like, if it's like an open-ended like, hmm, think about it individually, or is something that it's advocating for the whole collective movement, or like. So. Yeah. I, I really want to that's a huge question. That's a good it's one. a good question. Um, You've heard that I'm trying to decide if I should talk about it now or if we should talk about it during or after the lecture. I vote uh, during. Huh? I vote during. Okay. Just My smart ass response, having spent 12 years in Catholic parochial schools, is try the efficacy of prayer. That's what <laughs> Sister Mary Louise used to say. What about some Buddhist? <laughs> Which I am. Yeah. Didn't work. I wasn't Catholic either, so you know, the efficacy yeah. of prayer. Um, I'm just kidding. Yeah. The, that comes up in the kinds of things we're talking about. The short answer to your question is um, there, there, isn't, <clears throat> there isn't an answer. There isn't a, you know, here's the, here's the I mean, even if I could give you a paradigm or a schema or a theory, it would be so counterintuitive and I want to say anti-social against most of our social grounds that it wouldn't work. And this is, uh, I think I asked this the other day. Has anybody ever read the new book by uh, Naomi Klein? Uh, this changes everything. The one that the, Climate versus the right, capitalism. You right get a little right. piece of it. That's a 505-page book. Her argument here is that the root of all of these problems is capitalism, global capitalism. And it's evil, and we just have to get rid of all of global capitalism. We have to do it in the next ten years. Which is, I kind of like been saying the same thing. As if I'm more like a socialist. I mean, you have not socialism in the terms of like they would see socialism as socialism as like the way that you say socialism here, and people just kind of like. Just oh yeah, Bernie Sanders, the communist. But more socialism in a way like a more moderate socialism, like the one in Europe. And I don't see the people in Europe suffering or not having rights or. Right, right, right. Um, I think the closest I can come for an answer, if you read Aldo Leopold, the famous screen is dark, but it's still recording. 
Gary Aldo Leopold, the famous American environmentalist, um, he talks about a land ethic uh, in an essay where he calls that he calls thinking like a mountain. He says we're only going to get out of these problems if we think like a mountain. For him, a mountain. This is straight um, Senshaw's class. He says a mountain is an interconnected system, and whatever one it is a commons, if you will, and whatever happens in one place affects the whole community. Um, socialism, a kind of European democratic socialism, it might be a solution. Uh, Leopold suggests that it's an ethical problem. We have to have a land ethic. Think about the fact that what we do, what any, this is coming straight out of heart, that we have to have an ethical moral commitment to that long-term sustainability of the land. And it exists in some places. When I lived and worked in Iowa, a lot of the small farms had that kind of land ethic. The farm had been in the family for 100 years. The big farmers, you know, that were running 10, 15,000 acres of corn with, you know, half a million dollar tractors, they didn't care. They leased most of the land. It wasn't their land. There was no ethic. So, in a sense, your question asks Naomi Klein's question, which is, how would we be more sustainable in a kind of fast capitalist system? Um, the answer in most Western countries is, this is why no name and client hates it, uh, is incremental change, moderate incremental change. You know, my metaphor of shotgun shell with lots of silver pellet. There are lots of things you can do um, to try to solve those problems and come up with a, you know, a whole new you know, paradigm in which sustainability was the intuitive thing that we all were committed to. Um, would in fact require pretty much structural change in most of Western culture. Uh, America, at least, let me put it to you this way. America, this country at least, is predicated historically on individuals. And the political history of America is the struggle about the lecture I'm giving. You talk to uh, an American political theorist, they will say the narrative of American politics is the, is the conflict between structures and individuals. Individual rights and the necessity to have some kind of structure. And for sustainability really to become a new paradigm, we have to, in a sense, reverse our American, at least, historic commitment to the autonomy of each individual person and the priority of the collective good. Uh, Hardin talks about that. He says you have to get rid of, I don't know if anybody remembered this, he says, before we can solve the tragedy of the commons, this is on the fourth or fifth page of the essay, he says we have to exorcise the ghost of Adam Smith in the invisible hand of the market. Um, uh, Adam Smith, who is you, he's the, in the wealth of nations, he was the kind of granddaddy of the theory of capitalism. Most people don't read Adam Smith. Uh, they don't read the part where he says, it's unethical and immoral, and you should never take an unjust profit, uh, as high a profit as you can get. The profit you make as a capitalist should be minimal and always attached to the work and labor that goes into it. Nobody reads that part where he says, you know, you can't charge $100 for something that only costs $10 to make. What Hardin says, I think, is as close an answer I can give you. We would have to get rid of the reigning political and economic ideology in this country that says the free hand of the market, everybody acts for his own best interest, and it all works out for the collective good in the end. Hardin's whole argument is that's not how life works. That is still, nonetheless, the reigning ideology of American politics and economics. We have to change that. That's not a happy thing to say. I'm done. I'm going to go home and, you know, pull the covers over my head now. I can't say that. Well, it sounded, I don't know if you were trying to get at Julio, but it sounded like Partly what you were talking about was practicality, right? Like how do you practically get from where we are now to, like how do you go out in the world and sell sustainability in a practical way? I don't know if that was part of what you were getting at. Sustainability is it's all subjective to the framework of economics. Like how am I gonna say, the words that I have done, like in the environmental yeah. field now, I'm, I'm kind of like getting into this through my university and everything, but the words that I have done before were more like permitting, litigation, complying with the law, right. Right. All within the regula regulatory framework, yes. and all that I was doing as a environmental manager was like making sure my projects were in compliance, so my company doesn't get fined yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. So now, under sustainability, like when I'm preaching to my administrators, basically I'm telling them like, 
here is how things can quantify into savings. Yes. Therefore, so it's, it's still I'm working, I'm going from a regulatory framework more to an economic economic. framework, but it's not that we're doing this for, yes, we're doing this for the sake of the environment, but bottom line is savings, bottom line is finance. Yes. If there would be nothing, nothing, no gain, no nothing, yeah. then it would be harder to sell, it would, yes. you know, much harder to sell. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm just saying that all these is not, like really nice in terms of like theory and things to know, but there's not, a, like, we don't have a, I don't see like a movement on sustainability, like, it, it's like a citizen's social movement. Mm -hmm. I see it more as propaganda or stuff that is just, I mean, that's in my way, I mean, I'm doing it for me, so I just, yeah. the way, the reason what I'm doing it myself is just so I have the credential, yeah. so he can reconcile what I did before, what I'm doing now, do my own consulting. However, I mean, you know, in the, in the sake of making an argument in a class like this, I mean, you know, like the issue that here talked about science and climate, climate change, uh -huh. even if we all collectively decided, okay, we're going to solve climate change, like, let's work together, it would, it would not happen probably, or it would be too late. So we just have to like right now deal with the, what individually can everybody do to kind of like obey a little bit climate change. I mean, which, I don't know, it's mm -hmm. it's kind of like hard to, like people don't like to give up their luxuries or don't want to give up the Escalade or don't want to, especially now that, that the gas is so cheap. But anyway. Um, I've got about 10 more oh God, I have like 15 things I want to say, but I feel like we should. <laughs> this, I think all the things that you're saying are going to get sprinkled throughout, mm -hmm. right, this idea of, like you said, people don't want to give up their escapade, right? Um, that's the uh, not putting a lot of stock in the individual change side of things, which I'm, I'm curious, I have a question, like how many of you would call yourselves environmentalists or sustainability, interested in sustainability for life? Like how many of you have been this way since you were like, like you were raised this way by your parents, you've been this way since whatever, how many of you came to this somehow, right? came to this interest at some point. In your teens, anyone? Teens, 20s, 20s, 30s, right? So like that show of hands tells me that people can change. You know, something in your life brought you to this point where you're studying sustainability and wanting to share sustainability. Um, but, but that as you're pointing out, Julio, like that's not something we can necessarily count on or tap into and we need these appeals to economic self-interest, perhaps, to be able to make any kind of change right now, in terms of like getting a business on board. Or something. Well, I got into environmentalism because I went to study one year in Holland, and then I'm already- Dude, originally... if you want to become an environmentalist, move to Holland. Yeah, so I'm, I'm from Puerto Rico, so <laughs> yeah. going to Holland, the second year of college, was like going into two years into the future. Yeah. Like I felt that I came from a really primitive society, like going there and see what they were doing. So then I was thinking like, well, I mean, I cannot go by, you know, like what my culture said, I need to kind of like expand my, my horizons and do something better for the global, like uh, um, stewardship of this world. So, I mean, like, it flows in the fact that I like science. So it's just kind of like working. <clears throat> in, on the seventh page, I said, looking at it, of the hardened piece, where he says, how do we legislate temperance? There's an answer to some extent uh, he says, the morality of an act is a function of the state of the system at the time it's performed. Oh, they have a different, the page numbers are going to be different. Oh, okay. Um, I printed it. Yeah. Sorry. Um, it's in the section on how to legislate temperance. And there's a sense that he's trying to talk about, he's talking about population and individual reproduction and the state of the planet that's carrying capacity. You can read that, however, the morality of our reducing sustainability to economic calculation. Uh, this will, you'll notice that when this comes up in the lecture, uh, it's in the section, if you've read the lecture, it's in the section on Melanie Klein. Um, Naomi Klein. Naomi Klein, sorry, Melanie Klein's uh, psychoanalytic theorist. Uh, it's a section on Klein where she says, if you make those economic appeals, like to, my example in the lecture is ecosystem services, if you make those economic appeals, you're doing the wrong thing because you are merely reinforcing, taken as essentially our bedrock, an economic analysis, and we're never going to escape it. She said, just don't do that. So don't ever talk about sustainability in economic terms. Uh, she said, you just got to 
not talk economics at all, because as soon as you do, you're just reinforcing global capitalism and the big, big bad daddy. Um, on the other hand, Hardin will say, but the state of the system is that we tend to live in economic, economic rationality is the fundamental basis on which most people in Western, especially in kind of neoliberal economies like ours, make decisions. That's why you guys have a course on sustainability and sustainable economics. It is core to how sustainability is defined in the West in, in contemporary culture. Uh, I, don't, I don't got an answer for that one. I can tell you when I did research with farmers in Iowa, they would always talk about sustainability in terms of the usual three-legged stool, the land, the community, and money. But at the end of the day, money always trumped everything else. Chris? I was going to say, you know, coming from that standpoint, now I got to know those of you who are my LinkedIn connections see my really long, drawn out debates I have with people. In today's current system, like when we're talking about uh, you know, switching from a, a carbon-based economy to switching to renewable energy, uh, I made the point that it's really hard to convince a coal miner in West Virginia who coal mines for a living that he should support a policy that puts him out of a job unless we're giving him an alternative and training him and giving him a new job but at the end of the day, money comes down to, like my dad was a consultant for General Motors, and he went into their Texas plant and used sustainability principles, even though he didn't sell it as that, he sold it as, hey, I'm saving this plant $35 million with switching your system to reducing waste and material that you need as well as the energy output. But at the end of the day, unless we somehow go from being a, you know, a monetary-based economy to somehow giving up value of everything, I don't think that you can sell people strictly on the fact that you know you want to save the planet. That's great, but we got to live here in the meantime. Yeah, well, that was yes, and that was what I was just saying when I said the economics almost yeah. always trumps everything else. Paula. Uh, yes, in the first slide of the lecture, we'll get to that. The first paragraph of the lecture basically says, in all of social theory, and this is pretty much true for the last 70 years, I've read a lot of it, and in almost all environmental writing and debate, people tend to take one of two positions. Um, we have to change large structural government regulation uh, with climate change, the argument. So the, the, the theme for the readings are, do we change sustainability, climate change society from the top down through government regulation? Do we make gasoline $10 a gallon, which it should be if you count all the externalities involved in gasoline? Or do we change culture, sustainability, climate change, from the bottom up by the heart, winning the hearts and minds of individual people. Is social change an individual phenomena or is social change a structural or collective phenomena? Behind that, well, those are, that's in the reading. I'll get to a couple of things behind that in the lecture. And the Klein piece and the Diamond piece tend to take opposite sides of that. Naomi Klein says, you know, damn the torpedoes, maybe they'll have government regulation. She wants to just tell you and just force it from on top. Diamond tends to want to talk to people and change people's minds. Um, the, this is a whole lecture in five minutes. The Aquil piece says, you know, my thesis, they're not mutually exclusive. They're not really contradictory. They are in theory, but in practice, you know, you can actually kind of do both. So that's the, um, that's the theme that runs through all of these readings, if you will. Which Carl and I thought we had we had come up with that, we thought we were so smart, and then we found that Aquil article, and we were like, great. Yeah, I mean, I wrote, you know, <laughs> we, we, wrote this, this. we wrote the, the yeah. piece of this lecture about two and a half years ago, and then six months ago, we read the Aquil. Oh, they already said it in print. We thought yeah. we were so smart. Yes. Pedro. Well, just uh, about for discussion, I don't know, uh, don't you think sometimes uh, we are doing a lot of stuff? of sustainability like 25 years or so we don't really perform maybe 30 years so the Brooklyn report was yeah. 25 years yeah. ago yeah, yeah. Uh, and then uh, you do have like the top working or let's just say the US uh, it's been uh, you know investing in renewables uh, well it's 
say whatever you want about fuel or gas, but it's a better than coal. Um, and people are starving, so it's kind of difficult to move without moving into the middle, like we talked about. The water That's the Aquil piece, well, yeah. yeah. But this is the question that sometimes, yeah, you're doing a lot of stuff, but It's nice to be the most upbeat class ever, isn't it? <laughs> um, I'm afraid you're right, is why I joke about it. Boy, let's ask tough questions. You know, that, that, that's obviously not a question I can answer. It's, it, it's not something that has an answer, but how about this? Um, when I was growing up, the river that runs through uh, the town I grew up, that my father now lives on, the Catawba River, um, was toxic. You know, you couldn't swim in it. That was full of sewage. Um, there was a dye plant uh, that made dyes for clothing for textile plants just upriver, and they dumped all their poop and all their dye stuff in the, in the river. Uh, it was full of nutrients. Um, and back in the 70s, uh, as a result of the EPA being founded, the environmental movement, largely triggered by Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring. Anybody know this book? Mm -hmm. Here in Sustainability, you've got to know this book. It's like the, one of the two or three founding texts in American environmentalism and sustainability. And um, you can swim in that river now. Uh, you can fish it. You can eat the fish out of the Catawba River now. Uh, I don't know that I would drink it, but you know it's not toxic. Um, I can, you know, I can think of uh, Tampa Bay, right? Uh, the seagrass and the fish life in Tampa Bay right now is so much better than it was 30 years ago. Are we doing enough? I don't know. We, we banned high phosphate fertilizer during the rainy season in, the county, in Hillsborough County. That helped. Um, this is one of those things where I'm agreeing with you and disagreeing with you. If I were 30 years younger, I'd say, no, we're not doing enough. At my age, I'm saying, but we are doing a lot. And um, just kind of like, these are one of those things that you can never do enough. You, you know, you, if you're, this is the kind of thing that would probably drive you nuts if you were a doctor and you worked in um, a poor community and you did public health. You can never save everybody. You're not, you know, you need to be working 24 hours a day and work yourself to death. You know, I can imagine that doctor saying, but, but if I didn't sleep, I could save one, you know. Sooner or later, he's going to have to take a nap. Uh, so I'm in my late, late middle, maybe, not quite old fart yet. I will say we've made a lot of progress, and I think we have made some difference. You can look at any cultural change. I'm talking now about America in this country. And, you know, the civil rights movement. I grew up in the 60s. I remember the race riots. I remember the town I was grew up in under curfew with police in the streets. Um, I remember living in a town where if you were black, you couldn't eat at a restaurant. I'm not saying, you know, you read your newspaper, race is a problem in America. Not the same way it was when I was a kid. So you can say that for women's rights, gay rights, you know, um, African American civil rights. I think you can say that for environmental things. So. You know, I'm almost never recognized by my friends and students in English as a happy face guy who's Mr. Optimism. Um, can I say this on film? Yeah, the world sucks. Um, you, you're either going to say it sucks, I give up, and you know, go move to the country, eat a lot of peaches, you know, try to find God on your own, or you're going to try to figure out, well, it does actually make a difference what we do, what we say, how we vote, the kinds of policies we. Um, Naomi Klein aside, we're not going to change all this quickly. The, the, the terror of climate change, if you read all the stuff about climate change and social change, what they will say is the problem is the scale of change we need has to be global and international. And the time scale, we better do it now because we don't have any time left. You know, we've screwed, screwed around for the last 30 years. In some ways they're right, but this is the thesis of my lecture. The best is the worst of the good. OK, the best thing to do would be completely, she's right, completely change global capitalism. We'll solve the sustainability problems. 
But if that's what you're trying to do, my argument today, is then you're not going to do the incremental good local things you can do. I think changing the world is too big a task for me. Changing a little piece of the world. And I will actually be sincere for a minute. It's why I'm a professor. I've been doing this for 30 some years. I think slowly, incrementally, thousands of students have come through my classrooms and will come through theirs. We make a little bit of a difference as we go. And there's a whole lot of us doing that. But if that sounds like Father Mulcahy giving you a lecture from the pulpit, um, but you ask me a question that goes to the core of what I do, and I struggle with that all the time. Um, my version of that is in graduate school, and my two doctoral students will love this. Um, my wife, who's also a professor, we used to laugh and um, said, you know, when I die on my gravestone, I want them to, to engrave one of two things. I should be writing. I should be writing another article. I should be writing my dissertation. You, there's never enough. You know, we were working 100 hours a week, but could I get another 10 hours out of the week? 110 hours, I'd be more productive. And the, the funny part of that was, I once was writing, this is a play on Hamlet. I once was writing, now I'm rotting. <laughs> never enough. Does that make you feel better? Oh, Have we introduced Stephanie? No, we haven't. No. Stephanie. Yes. Take it away, Stephanie. Drum oh, roll. Oh, God. No. This is Stephanie <laughs> Phillips. Hi. Um, yes. Hello. Just 30 Tell seconds. Tell them who you are. All right. Um, I am one of Carl's doctoral students, and I am going to be helping them with this class. Um, so mostly grading, observation, and when Kegel goes off to her fantastic job at Kentucky, um, I will be, I, there's no way I can fill those fantastic boots, but uh, I'll be sitting in that chair. <laughs> yes. And yeah, that's about it. So, so that's I'm why we ask you to fill Stephanie in when we when you email us as well, so she can get a handle on the course. Yeah. Mary's Mary. got something. Oh, sorry. Yes, Mary. Um, well, I have a question for the board. Well, not necessarily for the board, but a question, like a question. Um, and I wasn't going to ask it because it's also big and it's a hot board issue. Well, after these two but guys, I you know, know, go for it. <laughs> What's next week's Powerball number? Um, <laughs> and then also, it is a thing. It seems very important because yeah. they're like, oh, this is the only way. To, like, it's at the conclusion of one of the articles, they say yeah. this is the only way to do it is to make a resume for them. It's like, well, how do you do that? Um, and then it goes. I was, I was thinking that question, and then you also said the thing about when did you change? You know, when did you make bold? And I was like, yeah, I would like to know why. At what point in time did this totally change your mind? And it's like, oh, this is a really important issue. This is how did that happen? So is there research on this? I was like, yes. Degree, so so this is a lot of what I, I have read um, for my work on climate change. Uh, there is, in fact, a lot of research on coming out of two big places, psychology and <coughs> communication, primarily mass communication, looking into this question of resonance. They don't use the word resonance always. Um, they'll use salience. They'll talk about theory. salience, or they'll talk about um, uh, uh, or appeals, right? What appeals work for certain people. So you'll see, for example, um, psychologists will go and talk to um, people who are environmental activists, right, who, or who do participate in this kind of graduate work in sustainability, like people who have somehow made a committed change. I literally just yesterday read a chapter about, um, it was an ethnographic study of, so this was a, an anthropologist um, of a very green community in England. And it's this you know, small local community where everyone rides bikes and is active and um, protests and all of that. And, and specifically looked at what are the ways in which this community gets formed? How uh, are these people appealed to? So a little bit of anthropology. But, so in psychology, for example, you might see a psychologist go out and talk to flood victims and see if the experience of having been a victim of a flood changed your perspective on environmental issues. Or you might see um, a psychologist or mass communication researcher uh, do a, a, like a laboratory experiment where they take three groups of people and prime one with an article uh, about climate change that, that uses a lot of fear appeals. This kind of what we're talking about here, what uh, I guess you brought up for real about the doom and gloom, right? Everything's so terrible, we can't do anything, don't talk about economics. And then you'll. And that doesn't work. And that often doesn't work. And so then they'll prime a second group with something of like, um, 
uh, a, a news article that uses a lot of appeals to technology, like climate change is terrible, but we've had some success, and like let me tell you this success story. And then the third group, they might not tell them, prime them with anything, and then they rate them based on their responses to questions about environmental um, beliefs or climate change beliefs. And so that's one way that they're trying to get at resonance. But as we learned from Kahane last week in cultural cognition, if you remember that, that all people don't interpret those things the same. And so part of the, the sticky problem for those researchers right now is trying to sort out which people respond to different things in different ways. So I think that research originally started with the idea that we could find a silver bullet, that we could find arguments and appeals that resonate with everybody. And so you'll get a lot of, you'll find studies that say fear never works and it just makes people shut down in the face of climate change. And then you'll find alternate studies that say, usually older ones, that say fear is really successful and like it's helped us get rid of the incredibly high smoking rates that we used to have in the US. Um, but trying to sort out those, that research and those findings from A, the structural changes that have happened at the same time. So smoking as an example, right? We might say, oh, well, fear appeals have really helped to, having those you know, ads on television or whatnot helped to cut so down. Those god-awful billboards you see with, right. with half of his face missing. Have helped to cut down on smoking, but <laughs> if that's not accounting for the fact that more and more public spaces have banned smoking over the years, that we and can't cigarettes really, have gotten more and more expensive. Yes, so we can't really say whether it was in fact the appeal to the individual or the structural change, right? Um, there's also uh, the problem, of course, so you have to both separate those findings out from what was actually going on otherwise that might have affected that person, and you have to try and, and make your way through those findings while knowing uh, Kahane's findings that people read facts in different ways. So the fear appeal might work with some and, and not with others. So we could, in fact, uh, and I'm happy to point anybody who wants this to some of these resources, could, in fact, just pull a, sh a, a ton of resources that have specific psychological findings or mass communication findings saying, definitely use fear appeals, definitely use hope appeals, definitely use technology appeals. The problem is whether or not those are reliable findings and whether or not they'll resonate consistently with the people that you think they will. And the other problem... So that, yeah, the last people, okay. they resonate with people you're thinking of. Uh, somewhere in the Ockwell and Marsh piece, about halfway through, they say, um, you need to be smart about your communication. Actually, it's about three quarters of the way through. And they say you have yeah. to, I mean, this is straight up American marketing. How do you sell Cheetos to people? Um, oh, yeah, there's that you moment where you're like, we should do focus groups. Yes, and segment your market. <laughs> yeah. um, so you think about what individual people's or groups, this is, it's like writing. You can think about individual people or you can think about audiences. Um, if you think about an audience, a group of people who have something in common, what do they value? What do they do? So you can, um, when we were in Iowa, we worked with Ducks Unlimited, a bunch of hunters, guys who went, who went out, you know, what they did on weekends is they went out with their shotguns and they shot ducks. And you think, oh my God. But they were really committed to particular kinds of environmental and sustainability practices for water and for soil and for land. Because they knew that if we didn't take care of the water and soil and the land, there wouldn't be any ducks. And I didn't get to go out, get my shotgun, and you know, sit out with my, my buddies. And you know, I'm not making fun of them. Some of my friends do this. And, and shoot ducks. My version of that is what, so you're asking what resonates. Another, I'm thinking of the Myers book on engaging the everyday. One of the things Myers said, and we talked about little pieces of his work last time, he says, how do you get things to resonate? Things resonate not because they are abstract ideas. They resonate because they attach to your habits, your routines, the things you do for pleasure, the things that tell you who, they, who you are. So I talked to my next door neighbor, not the one on this side who doesn't believe in climate change, but that one, who's got a boat and he fishes. And we talk about fishing. And we talk about the ecosystem in Tampa Bay. And I've gotten him to stop putting fertilizer on his yard. And I tore all the grass out of my yard so, and put in basically local plants that I don't have to water, don't fertilize, you know, all zero scapey stuff. And he's now saying, yeah, you know, that's a pretty good idea. You got a really beautiful yard. He likes to garden. You know, there's Scotty and there's me. Saturday, we're out there gardening. Um, and he likes to garden. He likes 
my plants. He talks to me about the plants. I talk to him about fishing. I am so, it resonates to him that he loves the beauty of the flowers. He doesn't like the work of the grass. He recognizes mine as labor-free virtually, and he's a fisherman. He can, A, spend more time fishing, and B, if everybody did it, the bay would be better. And when I talk to Scotty about those things in sustainability, that resonates for him. And I sometimes try to kind of piggyback on those things, talk about other things like climate change and carbon footprints. Uh, he's, he's a district state of Florida manager for a gourmet coffee company, and he drives all the time. And he drives a great big, huge SUV. And I've been trying to slowly convince him to drive a more sustainable little car. But resonates. It's like, I'm big. I need a car with a lot of head and leg room. So I try to talk to him about comfort. Does this make some sense? Yeah. Resonate is, is in some senses, the Aquil piece on page, second page, 306, says, we define engagement as having three key components. I'll tell you my three key components in a minute, why there are three of them. Cognitive understanding, affective emotional interest, and behavioral action. And they talk about the attitude behavior gap. So you can you have cognitive understanding. You can give them the facts, deficit model. It doesn't usually work. You have to appeal affectively to their emotions. And but resonate is how do you get across that last one? How do you get from, yeah, okay, I understand. Wow, you're right. Now I'm going to change. Now I'm going to give up something really valuable. I'm going to actually sacrifice something quickly. Yeah, I was going to say, with the Resonate case, when you were talking about like your neighbor, I have a friend who is a Republican. He's a member of one of our branches of government. And you know he's a, a definitely a climate change denialist. But his issue with it is the way that it's approached and basically telling him how to live. If you talk to him, you know, he, he cares about you know, the water, he doesn't like pollution, you know, he, he wants clean air, he wants all the things that go hand in hand with climate change, but he doesn't want to be told that his way of life is wrong, but if you, if you, you know... And no that's what we were talking about, wants. that's what we were talking about last class when I was quoting Myers in the deficit model, that if you, unos dos a, if you just spout facts and explain things and how smart I am, he's just going to piss him off. It's yeah, just going to create resistance. It's and he resists mad. because he sees those of us who think we're smarter than he is, he is or who disapprove of his life, what Myers was calling the outsider critic. That is, you know, you come in from the outside, you tell people that they're wrong and what they do, and it just creates resistance. It is logical and rational. It is rhetorically. It is strategically the craziest thing. So your your yeah. your friend is an exact example of what we were talking about yeah, last. He puts up a brick wall, but if you you know talk to him, you know he's mad about the Flint thing. He's mad about you know the acidification of the oceans. He's yeah. mad. He has kids. He wants clean air. He just doesn't want someone to come in and tell him that hey, your way of life is wrong. You need to change it. Yes. He wants to change, come to that conclusion on his own, and change it when he wants to. So what you do instead is you try to talk about things that resonate with him. So you talk about um, cleaner air for his kids. You talk about open space for his kids. You talk about the things, and I'm increasingly convinced that Meyer is right. Um, you don't pit sustainability or environmental change as against him and against his values, where you, you force a contest. You, so I'm not going to force a contest with my neighbor, Scotty, Frankly, I kind of like the guy. Um, I try to talk to him about things we both value, that, you know, things like gardening and fishing that resonate with him instead of saying, I mean, he's got grass, and he has an automatic sprinkler system, and it's on a timer, and it can be raining, and his sprinklers are going. I don't say a word to him about it because I'm just going to offend him, push him away. I'm going to lose my credibility. I wish he didn't do that, but I understand how difficult it would be for him not to. To do that. So I talk about the things that I know will resonate and bring him, you know, I, I'm one of those incrementalists that Naomi Klein doesn't like. I think I can bring Scotty slowly around to coming toward my way of thinking. Okay, so do we have a lecture here or have we done it already? Well, most of it. Most of it. Why don't we any on, last questions? Yeah, any last questions that I should put on the board? We did, like, 
when you ask the questions in advance, it's gonna it's gonna bring questions from all throughout the lecture. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, that's the plan. Yeah, that's, that's okay. Plan. Um, that's how this works. Okay. That's how this works. Yeah, yeah. In, you know, um, we're trying this out. In, in, in my graduate seminars in English, I never write a lecture. I, I read everything that sits in my head, and we just talk for three hours. <laughs> um, although I often have a lecture in my head, but it's not written out for people yeah. to read. Um, but not everyone's comfortable asking their question in the middle of a conversation. Yes, so. not everybody. And, and you know, I'm, we're, we're doing this because we know some of you are thinking, I finally figured out what question I wanted to ask. But that was 15 minutes ago, and the conversation has moved on. Yeah. And so, yeah. we're trying to give you a shot at a structure where you can ask them ahead of time. So now that I've answered, a null, null class just means a class of none. Zero, null, nil, nihil. So he says, um, no technical solution problems, problems that don't have a technical solution. He says, it's not a null class. There are lots of no technical solutions. Sustainability, I will suggest, is not a technical solution problem. You can't solve it with new technology. Um, a lot of my, you need new technology. A lot of my colleagues who are in engineering think, oh, engineering will solve everything. It's not going to. Sustainability, environmental problems are not technological problems. They're political, social problems. They are techno-social problems. They need both technology and social change. But null just means there's nothing there. It's an empty set. I really, in a way, like this is just like last comment you were just saying. Like I think if we don't achieve that balance with the systems, then the, you know the Earth is going to take care of things by itself. It's going to like whether we like it or not. Right? Whether we like it or not, yeah. nature always wins. So like we will, we will, it will, and sometimes we'll have to go through stuff like that in order to realize like the environmental movement really did not start it unless there were those tragedies with Love Canal and the pesticides and, and the Cajanuga uh, River going on fire and all that stuff and not being, uh, companies like dumping their waste in all the bodies of water and fish and things. And, and there were even, I was, there was a, there was a book that it was called like Toxic, Toxic Waste is Good for You. They were even making propaganda that toxic waste was good. Oh yeah. So it, it, it came to all that a point in time that, that we were like pretty much screwed to realize, oh, let's do something about it. And I think that we're being more reactive than proactive. Yeah. So at the end of the day, I mean, you know, it's going to be either if we want it or not, nature is going to do what it needs to do. So, um, yeah. uh, the short, the short answer, two, we get two short yeah. answers to that. Yeah, nature's going to do whatever. Um, climate change, the planet's, the planet's not going to go away. We're going to go away. Or our lives will change radically. What I love about the planet, by definition, the planet's going to be the yeah. ecosystems may change, the plants and animals may change, but you know that's just disruptive evolution. You know we're going to get screwed. Um, one of the basic yeah. principles of sustainability that I ran into when I was working with water guys, and I don't know if this is written down anywhere, but any system where you try to make natural processes adapt and adjust to human needs and processes is fundamentally unsustainable. A sustainable system is one where you take human needs or human systems and adapt those to natural processes. Not necessarily mimic them, but adapt them to natural processes, and that will be a sustainable system. In a certain sense, you know, if in American politics, economics is always the answer. In sustainability, the natural processes, if you fight against them and try to warp nature to fit your model, you are a, it's going to take a whole lot more energy and increasingly more energy, and eventually it's going to crash and burn. Amy, did you have something? I totally didn't have something. Yeah. Yeah. Just something else. I saw the red phone on Uh, I think we could thread that later. The, the, the short answer is the articles you're reading for today are about a very specific kind of problem. And it doesn't take up the role of the media or the role of the media. Yeah, you're right in to notice articles. the lack of it in here. The media yeah, it's, is not in, it's not in media. We pick the readings for every 
every day they are focused and they are thematic. There is, as you might imagine, and as your question suggests, there's a huge literature on what the media does, what effect the media has, what the media ought to be doing. Um, you know, media studies is a great big huge discipline. Um, I don't think we're much going to take that up. I think the big, the big uh, connection that I would say is maybe worth thinking about in relation to the structural individual is that one of the things that um, they, Ockwell talks about in this piece um, is the challenges to dealing with the, um, the problem of climate change through either method, right? Individual, as I think most of our conversation has been focused, is the difficulty of changing people's minds, right? And actually motivating them, this is your question, Mary, motivating them to behavioral change. But there are problems with structural change, too, right? And they talk about that in here, the, the lack of political legitimacy that a lot of parties and governments see in taking up environmental issues is one uh, example, but the other challenge that they mention is time frames. That uh, the time frame associated with a lot of sustainability issues doesn't match political time frames, and so you end up with this kind of short-term, long-term tension. Why should a president who's going to be out of office in two years deal with climate change and lose popularity when climate change, when the real bad effects, the crisis that might hit, as Julio was talking about, isn't going to happen for 20 years? And uh, the media is, in fact, susceptible to a lot of, in this big literature Carl's talking about, a lot of the same uh, critiques that are made of the political system in that uh, if it bleeds, it leads, right? Media only reports on it if it's exciting and new and it's going to get clicks on the headline. And uh, things are going to be terrible in 20 years is not a great headline. So that's, that makes it very hard for a lot of sustainability issues as well. So I think there's a connection there between the two. But absolutely, media is, is not so much on the table with this particular issue. I can see a point of comments that we hear saying and how that resonates with people. Yeah. Excuse me, I'm just thinking that because they just said that. And just, and just how well. Well, you know, there is the, the kind of, one of the kind of standard truisms of media or of advertising is if you saturate the market, you tell people something enough that eventually they'll begin to internalize it and it will begin to, if not resonate, it'll begin to echo. Uh, on those rare occasions when I actually watch TV, largely with my 12-year-old, you can watch an hour show and see the same commercial six times. And eventually, you know, even my dog knows what the commercial is. And, you know, when the commercial <laughs> comes on, you know, the dog Rory, oh yeah, I want a burger too. You know, it begins to resonate because you've heard it so many times. <laughs> Saturation. Uh, but that, Okay, uh, but let me talk about, I mean, you read the lecture, I'll move through it fast at this point because we've covered a lot of it. Um, and, uh, blah, 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 blah. and it's 652. Yeah. Okay, right. so in any kind of theory of social change, you're going to have the tension we've been talking about between top down and bottom up. Um, I like this, the nice little alliteration. Does it force or foster? The two words that sound alike suggest opposite possibilities. Um, there you go. My argument, that is, there are things like climate change where it's clear that only structural change represented by policy and regulation, in this case global, the UN, the IPCC, is going to be an adequate response to large problems in sustainability and management. Um, water usage in California, you know, they built California, they built it during a historically wet period, they're out of water. <clears throat> The only way they're going to be able to manage their water problems in California is when Governor Jerry Brown declares an emergency and tells every city that they have to cut their water use by 25%. Because in its emergency, it's got to be done fast. It's got to be done through government regulation and management. On the other hand, individuals, local groups, stakeholders play a significant role in the kinds of large-scale political social change that are necessary to sustainability, a policy, you know, no politician. You know, whether it's Bob Buckhorn or President Obama is going to risk a policy on sustainability in the future if there's not a public support for it. And one of the things that we need to think about is individuals, local groups supporting policy change. Uh, my thesis is it's not one or the other, but both. So, and now I'll, I'll gloss 
50 years of social theory and a couple of slides. Anytime you talk about social change and social structure, you're dealing with what is probably you know, one of the most vexed questions in the humanities and the social sciences in the last 30 or 40 years. And that question is the relationship between individual people and large social structures. If you read Marxist theory, it's called ideology. If you read capitalism, it's just called economics. So the question becomes, do large social structures determine how we think? I am robot. I am robot. You know, this is Marxist theory that the veil of ideology, we're all little puppets where everything is determined for us. In which case, individuals don't even really exist. You might as well do heavy-handed social change because there's no such thing as an individual. Everything down to what flavor of ice cream you like is predetermined for you by large social structures. On the other hand, there's a school of social theory that says individuals are autonomous. They are free. They are capable of acting freely. I can dance to a different drummer. I am completely autonomous. I think for myself. And if you really believe that, you're just as deluded as the guy who thinks we're all robots. Um, if we really believed that, we wouldn't have any advertising. We wouldn't have any government regulation. We wouldn't have education. Um, that leads us to what is the core social theory question of theory, if you want to talk about social change and sustainability, and that's the question of agency. Can individual people think for themselves? Can they make decisions? Can they, in fact, take action? Do they have the potential to be social agents and change, or are they merely subjects? Are they merely, if you will, robots to large structures like the economy? Um, my version of this goes, when I try to explain this to undergraduates, um, The American tax code tells me what house I need to buy. It tells me, here's a price rental family income. If you buy a house with this size mortgage, you can maximize your tax deduction. Um, my wife and I paid about $80,000 in taxes last year. And if we buy a house, which we have, and we have a big, big ass mortgage, which we have, we can get a tax deduction that says, because you pay this much interest on this mortgage, we will, we will charge you X, in our case, about $15,000 a year, less taxes, because you're paying a mortgage, and that's something the government wants to support. Once I buy that house, then I live in a particular neighborhood, and it's not a rule, but you know, everybody in the neighborhood drives, you know, take your pick. Everybody in the neighborhood drives <clears throat> a BMW. And when we moved in, I had an 11-year-old pretty beat up old Subaru. And fine, I kept it and all, but you know, you're the one guy everybody looks at, you know, and if you live in that neighborhood, you end up, you know, and you're in that tax bracket, you end up going to dinner. But the restaurant that I'm gonna go to dinner at, I can't go in shorts and a t-shirt, so I have to buy the right clothes. If this makes any sense at all to you, all the way down to what clothes I wear, lifestyle can be influenced by the tax code that tells me what name, or better yet, I live in the neighborhood because I have a 12-year-old daughter, and I don't want to spend, anybody got school-aged kids? Yeah, private school tuition runs 16 to 20,000 a year. I don't want to do that. I actually believe in public schools. So I live in one of the best public school districts. So the structure of American education means I live in South Tampa, where my house costs twice as much as if I lived in a less in, in a district with schools that weren't as good. So how much, how much agency, how much freedom do I have to determine where I live, what kind of house I live in, how big it is, how expensive it is, how big the mortgage is, what car I drive. Now, you know, nobody told me, here, live in this house. But there's a lot of coercion, there's a lot of influence that pushes me to live in a particular way. Um, the theory of agency says, well, I didn't have to buy the biggest house in the neighborhood. And I might, you know, I could decide that I want to live in, what's the one up just off? Seminole Heights. Seminole Heights. You know, funky houses. I could save about $350,000 on my house. And the local school is a failed school. And I'll have to spend the sixteen dollars to 20000 a year to send my kids. I get choices. So what social theory will say, and this has to do with sustainability, the question of how do people change? How do people make changes? Uh, Julio is not wrong that economics tends to trump things. 
But economics is up here. I'm an economic idiot. I do what the economic argument tells me to do. There are some people who will argue and behave counterintuitively against economics. So the question becomes, you know, are we individuals or are we determined by structures? How much agency do we have? That's the theoretical question that we struggle with, he said. Uh, the Aquil Whitmarsh and O'Neill piece that Hegel and I wish we had written um, says human agency and social structure is a more salient in determining action and bridging about change is a long standing debate. So, and they quote this guy, Anthony Giddens. And, you know, like, yes, well, Joshua. Can I comment on your um, comment that, like, economics is like a huge social structure? I mean, while it is also a, you can view it as an institution, um, it is also an individual thing. I mean, you have microeconomics, you have macroeconomics. I mean, micro sure. is the study of individuals responding to incentives, and each individual has their own set of values, um, set of objectives, goals, um, and they respond to those differently, regardless of the economic institutions in place, which obviously like influence the decision and create incentives, but individuals at the same time have their own set of values, goals. Yeah. I think uh, that's something to consider. I mean it's not necessarily just economics is dictating downwards. I mean I as an individual have my own values that I can see from. That is so, uh, I agree. That is almost exactly um, what I would suggest down here, that is, uh, think about, you know, take your pick. Uh, they've increased the cost of a pack of cigarettes to about $4 a pack, right? So there is an e five. So there's an economic structure, an economic macro structure, a tax structure imposed by a government. Um, but a lot of people still say, okay, you know, I, Despite that, I'm going to make my own choices. I have my own values. I see that you can't make me. And, you know, I am not a robot. I am going to continue buying cigarettes. And I am going to dance to my... Um, no, what's the, what's the drug in, in cigarettes? Yeah, I'm going to dance to my nicotine drum, drummer. Um, so I'm agreeing with you. Uh, in fact, macroeconomics is, in fact, a set of social structures and tax policies and regulatory policies. It's what Garrett Hardin is arguing for, that what we need is what he calls um, coercion. That's what policy and regulation does. But the, the question of agency would say, OK, not everybody is there for their shape and they are influenced. They aren't going to be forced to. And the question becomes, how much leeway do you have? How much is it going to cost you? you know, how much you know, and why would you be willing to pay $5 for a pack of cigarettes? Um, there are lots of answers for that. And so, you know, anything like a smoking campaign is exactly the instantiation of the debate about do individuals get to make choices and should we let them or should the government make those choices and force them using not cast Sunstein nudges but heavy-handed top-down things. So I, th I think you're absolutely right. What you just said is, but those large things aren't all powerful. You can still act otherwise. Um, you have agency. You can still see, make decisions, and act otherwise. The question becomes, how expensive is it to do that? I don't mean money expensive. I mean, you know, money, spirit, time, energy, identity expensive. There's an idea of rationalism in economics where it costs you more to find your information than it does the cost of not knowing your information. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that. Uh the interface between ma macro and micro that you're talking about and this idea of the rational agent, I think points to one of the big issues that sometimes gets alighted in this debate about structure versus individual, which is that not all individuals are located equally in society. So when you talk about individual values, right, in the microeconomics of the choice to buy the $5 pack cigarette or more, um, more relevant to our interest perhaps in this room, the choice to build a beach house, um, is you're going to make that choice different depending on how much money is actually available to you in addition to just your personal values and your personal ideas and whatnot. And so your actual like social location and privilege and uh, economic standing means that that's one of the big underlying criticisms of rational actor theory, right, is that uh, 
all individuals in society are not made equal, and so trying to treat them all as, as in, interchangeable units, these rational actors, is really problematic. And I think that's so true in sustainability. I agree. Yeah. We should talk at some point. I can talk talk that about macroeconomics all day long. <laughs> For me, the problem is the other way around. It's when individual has no choice. Uh, I can take an example. Uh, why are some guy skating the rainforest down in Brazil? I have no choice. It's the only way to think that the human state is so uh, another I just saw Brazil has like It's not because they have the conscience to do it, it's because people just don't have a job and they don't think of it. We have so much to handle. So I do understand that when you have choice, it's good. But for sustainability or environment, when you don't have a choice, it becomes a problem. Yeah. There's a, um, a fellow named Julian Agumon who has forwarded this idea of sustainability justice. There's in the United States a movement, a social movement around environmental justice, which many of you I'm sure have heard about, uh, often focused on targeting local problems in local communities. And that's very much an example of what Carl was talking about, where individuals can come together and collectively uh, advocate upwards for social change and structural change. And, uh, and that, that is a place where those two forces can come together. Uh, Julian Agumon was sustainability justice tries to expand that globally, he writes a lot about the global south, and makes exactly this point, that if we continue to treat sustainability as a primarily Western issue and, and ignore the ways in which it's bound up in systems of economic and social injustice, then uh, we are missing out on a lot of opportunities to solve environmental problems, precisely because there are lots of situations where people don't have the choice to do the environmentally friendly thing. Yeah. Chris's example of the guy from the coal mine who lives in West Virginia. The example I can think of, because I've written about it, in a lot of places in um, the Caribbean and in uh, the Pacific Basin, you've got um, islands, communities, areas, where the, the fishery is dying uh, because people need protein. They need food. They don't have a choice. And they eat the, the small fish. They eat the the fish that are too young to have reproduced, and it's a choice of not feed your kids and die, or do something that's unsustainable. And, there, and uh, the, the response to that is usually environmental or sustainability justice. You can't ask the coal miner to stop doing that until you can provide him an alternative that's really viable and practical. You can't ask somebody to stop eating unsustainable seafood practices when the alternative is starving to death. Um, that's not a communication problem. That's a that's a you know a global that's an economic problem. Yeah, problem. Uh, problem. Quickly, yeah. I was gonna say it kind of depends on the country. Some countries, underdeveloped countries, sustainability, like you said, is almost a requirement. You know, you have a you have a small island that knows that in the next thirty years, if we don't make a change, that their island is gone, is more likely to care about sustainability than someone in America who doesn't really see a difference whether they you know, light their house with a solar panel or whether it comes from burning coal, it's not a it's a not a immediate danger to them that you can really put you're telling them that if they don't do it in seventy five years, the temperature is gonna go up two degrees and they don't really see they're like, Okay, well, my winter won't be as, as hot and as cold, I'll have less snow. But there's no real buy in for a lot of people. There's a lot of people in the middle that, you know, would be more than happy to do it. They're just not given really a viable reason or alternative to go ahead and, and become green. Yeah, I mean, part, of, part of the problem you're talking about, there are two or three things. Part of the problem is, yes, if they don't have an alternative, they can't do it. And that's the unfortunate grounds in which, I don't know if I can say this, sustainability sometimes is the privilege of the affluent. Um, when it's fish sustainably or starve, you know, or fish unsustainably or starve, then, and, and this is this is a global policy matter. This is the equivalent of the global South in climate change negotiations saying, we've got to cut CO2 emissions drastically. You guys in the global North 
are the ones who created the problem by pumping it out, and that got you where you are with these incredible uh, standards of living. If you want us to do it, we can only do it and play your game and act sustainably, cut the CO2, if you share the wealth and pay for the carbon neutral or low carbon technologies. Um, Brazil says, really? You want us to preserve these rainforests that are the carbon sink? We can't afford to do that. So you need to pay us to forego the profit we could make by timbering to, in fact, keep it for everybody's benefit. And you know the, the argument becomes sustainability is, is only for the affluent unless you have a kind of structural global change of, of sharing the wealth. Let me, let me quickly move to the, the, I'll be hopeful for a minute. Um, we were talking about economics, macro and micro. Um, this guy, Anthony Giddens, who Ockwell and Company cite, is a really famous social theorist. Um, and he tries to say there aren't social structures as if they existed out there and you know, separate from human beings. There are what he calls structural principles. And these structuring principles, he says, are both the medium and the outcome of social activity. That is, these princi they're principles, they change. They are, I'm trying to think of, like language. Language changes. It allows us to communicate and talk and do things. But as we use it, we change the language. Duh! I couldn't have said that 10 years ago. It's a thing. I couldn't have said that five years ago. Words come in. Language changes as you use it. And your use of language, any linguist will tell you this, that language is an evolving system that changes as people use it. This is why you know, old farts in English departments who say, you can't say that, you know, that breaks all the rules. The rules are always changing. There are almost no hard and fast. And what this guy says is that's true for social structures. Social structures like economics, like gender relations, take your pick. Um, they are the conditions that allow us to act and tell us who we are. But they only exist to the extent that we reproduce them by acting that way. That is, they, the principles, he says, these enduring principles are part of our culture. They are the context and resources through which we act. They are the medium of our activity. But they are also the result of long, repeated actions. They are the outcome. And they can be changed if you're in sustainability. If you're in environmental theory, then our relationship to the environment is, in some senses, a kind of structural principle. But it changes historically over time. It allows us to have the EPA, but eventually we will change um, our sense of what the environment is, uh, how we regulate the environment, how we deal with it. Those things that look like they are top-down structures are, in fact, always open to play. Um, and this, this applies to almost any social structure. Um, that's the most hopeful thing I can say. Um, we've talked about Garrett Hardin. Um, Garrett Hardin asks us these three questions. How do we share the commons? How do we balance that? And there isn't an answer. This is, this is a how do you balance uh, individual interests and rights against the long-term good of the community. This is the argument they're having in Burns, Oregon, the guys who took things over, right? The, the, the farmers, the ranchers who want to run their cattle on BLM land for free. They're individuals. They have the right to do that. It screws up the range, and the range belongs to all of us. This, that argument in Burns, Oregon is exactly an instantiation of this. And if you're in sustainability, you know, you want to try to get people to think about the long-term good of the community and moving individual interests towards the collective good. Um, does anybody remember what Hardin calls the freedom of necessity? This would be the climate change argument. It says, in some, in some cases, see if I can come up. Says, in some cases, you don't have a choice. There are things that you absolutely have to do. And in a sense, admitting them and acting that way is a kind of freedom. Uh, so, 25 years ago, my two-pack-a-day smoker dad recognized that he just had to quit smoking or it was going to kill him. And in a sense, recognizing that necessity was a kind of liberating moment. And he, bless his old heart, gave up smoking. 
Um, but how do we get people to, you know, the, the problem is, how do you get people to accept the good of the community to not give up their individual interests, but moderate their individual interests? How do you get people to recognize that it is actually, if we, if President Obama, bless his heart, has convinced the American, uh, the EPA, to say we have to raise fleet miles per gallon standards on American cars so that by the year 2025, the average American car is getting, I can't remember what it is, like 40 miles to a gallon instead of its current 20. Then there's a certain sense in which we all have the freedom of the necessity that we're going to have to buy more efficient cars. How do you convince people to do that? You guys might not remember this, but we had fleet mileage, mile per gallon, going way up, 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 um, especially after 1972 and the oil embargo, uh, the Arab oil embargo, when people waited three or four hours to mm -hmm. fill up their car tanks and you could only buy five gallons of gas at a time. All of a sudden, Americans started buying, demanding more efficient cars. Then a new president was elected in 1980, got rid of all those regulations, and we had a regulation that said mileage has to go up. They got rid of it, and mileage has gone down ever since. Uh, so we have a new policy. Thank you, President Obama, saying, you know, if you're building cars in America, you have to develop new technology so they get more miles per gallon. Um, okay, more practical things. Okay, I wanted to talk quickly about two of the readings, and, and I won't spend a lot of time on this. I gave you Naomi Klein and Jared Diamond just as examples of what the Ockwell piece is talking about, as examples of my thesis. Naomi Klein, essentially, if you read that, she says, what we need to do, climate change is coming down on us. It's a freight train. It's an emergency. Um, we need immediate, large structural change. We need, this direct, we need to directly challenge our reigning economic paradigm, the stories on which our culture is founded, as well as the activities that form our identities and define our communities. Is that all? We need to think big, go deep, and move the ideological pole far away from the stifling market fundamentalism that has become the greatest enemy of planetary health. This is, to some extent, her response to Julio's question about the economy. Um, she says, that's a big ask. No big deal, right? Yeah. yeah. It's a big ask, which strikes me as really strange. You just said, really? We need to change the global economy, whole new economic paradigm. Um, we need to change the stories we tell, our narratives of who we are. We need to change what we do and who we are. And we need to do it in the next 10 years. And we need to do it globally, or we're dead. That's, I mean, that's what she says, right? If you read on, she says, she says, look, we don't have time for polite incremental change. We don't have time for moderate people like Dan Kahane who says, you know, you want to appeal to people's framing. Hell, we need to throw your framing out, give you whole new frames, start from scratch, revolutionize the world. Um, we need to stop appealing to economic values. You know, tell that coal miner just to, Buck up, you know, pull himself up by his bootstraps and find something else to do. Um, because those are dangerous values. This is the structural argument in popular American culture. Um, anybody know what ecosystem services are? Okay, what are they? Yeah, my favorite example is pollination, is, is bees, honeybees. So an ecosystem service says, you know, this is something the ecosystem provides for us through its natural system operation that's incredibly valuable. If we didn't have those and we had to do it by hand, it would cost us a huge amount of money. And you can then talk about it as if it were an economic issue. And a lot of people, including Naomi Klein, will say, you can't use that word. Because what that does is it puts a price on nature. It just gives away the game and it says nature is an economic value. It has no intrinsic value. It has no moral value. You just said fine. Put a dollar sign on it. Everything has a dollar sign on it. You've got, you just can't use those metaphors anymore. I just remembered if anyone's an NPR fan or listens to a lot of podcasts, Radio Lab, the show that plays on NPR, has a great, about science, has a great episode precisely about this back and forth debate, what happens when we put dollar signs on nature. Yeah. Uh, if you're interested, this is a move straight out of Marx's critical theory. 
that invoking those words. This is, if Giddens says our principles are the medium of our activity, but also the outcome, Klein is saying, okay, economics is the medium of our activity. If we continue to act as if nature were economic and you had ecosystem services, we continue to get the outcome of economics is everything. So she's not wrong. You know, that plays into the notion that those structures are reproduced by our invoking and using them. On the other hand, you get Jared Diamond. I gave you a piece of Diamond uh, from his last chapter, uh, World is Polder. Anybody know that book? It's both a really wonderful book and an incredibly repetitive book. It's about 600 pages, and it repeats itself over and over and over All again. Huh? All of his books are quite like that. Yeah, yeah. but what he basically says at the end is, look, if we want to change the world and not collapse. He studies, he's a comparative um, environmental historian. He studies societies that succeed, and societies that have failed or collapsed. And he says, what decisions do they make? What leads to collapse? And his argument is for us, we need to change individual people's va basic values, things that are individually held. At the end of his book, he says, here are a series of choices that each of us can make decisions to buy this instead of this, you know, the incandescent bulb or the low carbon, what do you call it, the compact fluorescence. The LED, or LCD. Yeah, or LED bulbs. You can make, individuals can take action and make lots of choices. And he says, oh, he doesn't. He says towards the end of the book, he says, I'm gonna, I've told you all these stories to inspire you and motivate you as individuals to change your behavior. What you've got, and I'm not saying either one of them is right or wrong, I'm just trying to show you what the landscape and sustainability rhetoric, environmental rhetoric looks like. You've got Naomi Klein, top-down structural change, make them do it whether you like it or not. You know, she's basically going to be a, a, a tyrant and you're going to have economic despotism. Or Jared Diamond, look, let's, let's pass inspiring stories, tell people inspiring narratives, and give them inspiring images, and we'll change the hearts and minds of people. Um, they're both right. Um, I'm almost done. Uh, here's a nice way of thinking about this. A rhetoric guy, Kenneth Burke, a book called Grammar of Motives from 1945. Um, Burke is writing about philosophies of social change. What motivates? What's a, ch what's a driver? What motivates people to change? And he says we... Um, that we can tell a lot about how to change the world by thinking about what he calls the pentad. He says there are, is that a picture of it? Yes, it's a little picture. He says, when we talk about social change, people either say it's changed by individual people, an agent, or it's changed by a structure, a context, a scene in which we work. It's changed by an agency, a material thing like a new technology. It can be changed by a collective purpose or a collective act. And he wrote a whole book about this. The point of this book is, and my argument, what I'm trying to get at today. Hi. Um, yeah, my, I'll get back to that. My basic thesis, the notion that you have Structural change, that's the only answer, or individual change. They have regulation, or you change people's minds. is a false dichotomy. They work, this is what the Aquil piece argues. They work against each other. Um, but a great deal of writing about sustainability and environmentalism um, is predicated on one or the other of these positions. I think they both happen to be wrong. They tend to guide our communication. This is a better metaphor from Burke. He says... I've likened the terms, the things that make people change in the pentad to fingers, which in their extremities are distinct. So structural change over here, individual change over here. They look extinct. They look distinct in their extremities. So individual change, structural change, government regulation, individual. Uh, economics telling me what I have to do, individual economics individual people doing things that are economically perhaps not as rational. He says, they're distinct from one another, but they merge somewhere here in sustainability, in the palm of the hand. If you want to go from one finger to another, 
macroeconomics to microeconomics without a leap of faith, you trace the tendon down into the palm of the hand, and then you trace a new course to another tendon. That is, that they're all connected to each other. That was so when he looked at, oops, when he looks at how do you explain social change, the motive for activity, all these little lines here, his thesis, and he's right, is that everything that makes a social change is always some relationship between all five of these things. It's always all five of them combined, working together. Sometimes one of them takes precedence. Um, you've got Martin Luther King, the agent, the individual who helped catalyze change in American society. Very few of you probably know, you know, one of the things, scenic, structure, one of the things that allowed the Reverend King to do that was World War II. All of a sudden, our country was at incredible threat and risk from the Nazis, the racist, eugenic Nazis, and the American army, oddly enough, is one of the socially most forward-thinking institutions in the country. They integrated the army long before we integrated restaurants and schools. And it was very hard to keep up the structural racism in America when you had sol black soldiers coming back from defending their country and dying by the thousands in the trenches, shoulder to shoulder with white guys. It was very hard to come home and say, yeah, but you can't eat in a restaurant together. I shouldn't say this on film. I'm old enough. My family once got thrown out physically, out the door, pushed out of a restaurant in Charlotte, North Carolina, because we were trying. We had one of our friends to have dinner with us. He happened to be black. Within my memory, the family got physically thrown out the door of the restaurant. That has changed. So what Burke would say is, yeah, Martin Luther King, magnificent and necessary, but there were a whole lot of other things going on as well. It's never one or the other. It's always some combination of all of those things acting. So it's like the tendons on the hand. My thesis I've done. Come on. This is Aquil and Marsh. They say the same thing we do. It's only by the combination of top down and bottom up that the unprecedented challenge of climate change or sustainability can be effectively addressed. As with the discussion above highlights, one cannot be achieved without the other. Ah, quickly, our projects in the course. First project on accommodation, the first assignment, the epidictic, appeals to individuals. The deliberative piece, where you're talking to policymakers, appeals to regulatory change. It's a structural issue. Project two is about visualizing data. It appeals functionally to individuals. Project three brings it back together, and we have both the microplastics program, which deals to individuals, but it also tries to build structures, social structures, coalitions of people. Aren't I funny? Bye. I'm done. Yeah. Questions about any of this before we take a break? He's done. I'll answer questions. <laughs> no. I am well, so is, done. Uh, let's take a break, uh, and we'll reconvene at 7.40. Okay. And we have another kind of editing yes. game. Person style tips. Um, Person style editing game tips. But if you do have questions that have arisen. We've got um, an hour and a half left, right? Uh, hour and 15. Yeah. Uh, if you do have questions or thoughts that have arisen, this, this issue, this concept, this these problems that you did a very nice job putting into very big relief before we got started on the formal lecture are not going away, as Carl just highlighted. These undercut everything, yeah. not undercut, underlay everything that's happening from here on out. Yeah. This, is the, this is the second of the two lectures at the beginning of the course. We warned you. We're going to talk theoretically and conceptually and lay out what, if you do sustainability, environmental discourse, and you're thinking about language and communication, these are the two big gorillas in the room. These two, the rationalist paradox and the structure of individual issue. This runs through almost everything you will read about communication and sustainability. Yeah. We're done with the kind of great big overarching, the world is changing, is my glass half full, half empty? <laughs> but these issues will come up yeah. regularly for the next, whatever so it is, 12 weeks. To talk about yeah. All right, 7.40. Am I allowed to say smoke if you got them? Yes. Yes, you are.
tell you what this game is about. And then you'll see, I hope it's short. Um, my lecture is called Go with the Flow. How do you write so that your sentence paragraphs flow nicely and straight? You know, students are always asking me, teach me how to write sentences flow. So this is what I'm going to do. Um, anybody in here play chess? Okay, you know what retrograde analysis is? Okay, my doctoral and physical calculus professor in college, a graduate student, we used to hang out in the basement of the local bar during the winter um, doing calculus, and he was a chess player in Boston. So if you're learning to play chess, you want to be a really good chess player. You can get a book that will say, okay, put one, put this chess piece in this particular place on the board. Now, play the game backwards. And in 56 moves, or 113 moves, move from this position, moving, playing the game backwards, and putting pieces on as you go. Get to the opening board and opening move. Play chess backwards. What I'm going to ask you to do is play chess backwards. I've given you the first four paragraphs of a really beautifully written, very nice, popular book on sustainable bookkeeping. And don't cheat. Don't figure out what the book is. Go online and find it. And I've jumbled up the sentences. I put them in a random order. What I want you to do in groups of two and three is reconstruct retrograde analysis. Reconstruct the original article. What was the opening sentence? What was the next sentence? What was the next sentence? That is, I've given you a series of sentences that says, these are all, I've just got you know, this is four paragraphs from the beginning of a particular section of the book. They're nicely written. And we will talk about this later. Um, but see if you can read these and figure out, okay, this sentence comes after this, this one. Oh, this looks like the beginning sentence. Oh, this sentence has to come, this is the second sentence. As you do that, the really important thing here is make yourself some notes. How do you know? How do you know that that sentence followed that one? How do you know that it flowed nicely and naturally? It flowed so naturally that you could figure it out and put them together. This is like playing, you know, this is like doing the crossword puzzle in class. Make some sense? It's crazy. Go, go with me on this one. You've got a list of sentences. Read through them. Think about them. And see if you can figure out, okay, this is the opening sentence. And more interestingly, here's what comes next. And after half an hour? Yeah. After 25 minutes or half an hour, we're going to say, okay, stop. Read me your first sentence. Who has the first sentence? Who has the next sentence? Right? We're going to do this play game. So you get about half an hour. Read these. See if you can figure out where it begins and what comes next. And how did you know? Okay. It really is more fun. Yeah, it's more fun in groups of two or three. If you do this individually, it's no fun. Okay. You, you, does everybody understand what I'm asking you to do? Everybody got this? Okay. What to have for dinner is sales every omnivore and always have. Anybody got the second sentence? Let me get a candidate for the second sentence. Mary. Say it again. Okay, when you can, so read me the whole sentence. Okay, well, just about anything right. nature has to offer. Here, where's my little thing? Deciding what you should eat will inevitably be your hair and sight. Okay, anybody else got a second hood? Yeah. Anybody else got a candidate for second hood? For the second hood? Anybody else have the same one? Lots of people have the same one. So I will tell you that, in fact, that is the second sentence. Yeah. Anybody know what the book is? <laughs> the Omnivore's Dilemma by Michael Pollan. New York Times Best. Ah, oh, you've read it. How did you, so let me ask you, how did you know that that sentence came after this? What made you think? To one degree or another, the question, what to have for dinner is sales every omnivore and always has. And when you can eat just about anything nature has to offer, deciding what you should eat, will inevitably disturb, stir anxiety, especially if some of the professional, others give it up that some of the potential foods on offer are liable to sicken or fill you. How did you know? A bunch of you got it. Huh? Okay, so you get, somebody has asked a question and decided. Okay, that's logical.
What's the next one? If that's the second sentence, then you can even even libel, liken, libel the sick and poor kill you. What's the next sentence? Anybody got a candidate? Follow? Anybody else got a candidate for set for third hunt? Anybody got a candidate for yes? Okay, that is in fact the third sentence. Your version might work because you're going from the surface. Too many choices. And it makes logical sense of deciding what to do when what you should eat when some of it we're talking about a lot of sugar. That I will give you that. That is a logical second one when we look at sentence level things in a few minutes. I think I can explain why that's a better choice. But that is the next sentence. That is better. The third one is this is the omnivore's dilemma. Noted long ago by writers like Rousseau and Jean Sapin, first given that name 30 years ago by a university professor and researcher, Paul Rosen. You may got the next sentence. Mary? Oh, go ahead. Go for it. So you think the next one is this one. I have borrowed his phrase for the title of this book because the omnivore's dilemma turns out to be, anybody got the same sentence? Yep. Anybody got a, a, another candidate for fourth hood? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, this one from 1972. Um, in fact, in the book, you are right, that is the next sentence, and it is the end of the first paragraph. So the first paragraph <coughs> reads, to one degree, I got a cheat sheet, woo! Uh, to one degree or another, the question of what to have for dinner assails every omnivore and all they have. When you can eat just about anything nature has to offer, deciding what you should eat will inevitably stir anxiety, especially when some of the potential foods on offer are liable to sicken and kill you. This is the omnivore's dilemma, noted long ago by writers like Rousseau and Blayat Savarin, and first given that name 30 years ago by the University of Pennsylvania research psychologist Paul Rosen. I have borrowed his phrase for the title of this book because the omnivore's dilemma turns out to be a particularly sharp tool for understanding our present predicaments surrounding food. End of paragraph. How does the next paragraph begin? In a 1976 paper. Okay, so uh, I don't want to use up all my time. So next paragraph. In a 1976 paper called The Selection of Food by Rats, Humans, and Other Animals, Rosen contrasted the omnivore's existential situation with that of the specialized eater, for whom the dinner question could not be simple. What's the next sentence? Mary? The koala doesn't worry about what to eat. If it looks and smells and tastes like eucalyptus leaves, it must be dinner. How do you, you're right. How did you know? So he ends that sentence. The, the existential question of the specialized eater for whom the question could not be simple. And then this one, the koala, blah, 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 uh, is a specialized eater. It doesn't worry. It eats only eucalyptus. Yeah. Okay. Uh, last, uh, last couple of sentences before we look at this. What's the next one? This one should be easy. The koala's culinary preferences are hardwired into its genes. What's the next one? Mm, you're good. Um, <laughs> golly, you're good. <laughs> but for omnivores like us, the rat, uh, us and the rat, you know, me and rats, we're like this, you know, a vast amount of brain space and time must be devoted to figuring out which of all the many potential dishes nature laid on are safe to eat. Um, I think it, uh, let's stop for now. Can you give me the analysis slide? Okay, you guys did pretty good. 
uh, partly it's because Martha Coleman writes these. Uh, but I think she writes beautifully, and um, this, I don't know if we need to get to the PowerPoint, you know, my PowerPoint says, go with the flow, and it has a picture of a surfer and a wave, and go with the flow of the wave, and all I think is to be there, and certainly there. How do you make things flow? Uh, I will cut. Watch out what I say. <laughs> okay. Um, if you get to the PowerPoint, you can get to the PowerPoint. Here's, here's if you remember anything from the sex magic class, I want you to remember this. It's called the Ribbon Moon Hop. Uh, back in the 60s, two linguists, Clark and Haviland, uh, came up with this notion called the given new concept. This is back to psycholinguistics and cognitive processing. How do you process new information? Well, it's very simple. If I tell you something is new, what you tend to do is find something you already know, a category, a context, and you insert this into that category or context. You take something that you know that's given, and you use that as the framework for attaching the new information. Um, the way we process language, you start a sentence with things people know, and you put new information at the end of the sentence. Does that make some sense? Then what you do if you want your prose to flow is what's new information at the end of one sentence becomes given at the end of the next, at the beginning of the next sentence. You start with something they know, then you tell them something new. That something new is now given. No, you've read it, you know it. That becomes the place you begin your next sentence, to which you can add new information. So, to one degree or another, the question of what to have for dinner is sales. Every omnivore and always has. When you can eat anything that nature has to offer, that's what it means to be an omnivore. You just told me you're going to talk about omnivore, right? The next sentence begins with omnivore is somebody who can eat anything nature has to offer. Those of you who picked up that this was the next sentence, I think this is the syntactic, the stylistic, the psycholinguistic cue that told you this. And then you get some new information. Um, deciding what you should eat as opposed to can will stir anxiety because this could sicken and kill you. And holy buckets, that's, we've been talking about omnivores, that's the dilemma. You know, oh my God, if I choose the wrong thing, I'm dead. I have to choose, I can't starve, but I have to make a choice. It could kill me. That's a dilemma. What was new information here becomes where you start with. You're rephrasing, if you will, what you just learned in that sentence at the beginning of this one. And you add some new information to it. And that's not a new idea that was invented by these guys. It's the name given to this by a guy named Paul Rosen. Oh, and guess what? How did you, how did you know? How did you know you were correct? I have borrowed his phrase. Because the his phrase for, is a referential pronoun, it refers back, you just learned this guy's name, now you know it so well, you don't even have to say it, you've got the pronoun his. I borrowed his phrase for the title of this book because the omnivore's dilemma turns out to be a particularly sharp tool for understanding our present predicaments surrounding food. And we get essentially the same thing. We know this guy, we know it's the title of the book, and then a little history. Um, so we have talked about the omnivore's existential situation, existential, life or death. You know, it, it's, you know, you have to eat, you have anxiety, if you eat the wrong thing, it will kill you. That, we've been talking about an existential situation, and now let's talk about something new. Instead of the omnivore, let's contrast the specialized eater. And you're right, the fawn who doesn't have to worry about what to eat is not that makes him special. I don't have to worry about it. I eat one thing. If it looks and smells and tastes like eucalyptus, it must be dinner. What was new information, we're going to talk about specialized eaters, was what started this one. The guy who's specialized is the koala. He doesn't have to worry about it. The koala, the koala, oops, new information. Preferences are hardwired into his genes. And now I'm going to get to a 
a slightly different thing. Yeah, go back up to where we were talking about. Okay. Um, you can use particular words that are called proleptic linguistics. Words that tell you what the logical structure of the information is. It's, the word doesn't have any content, like omnivore or specialized, or this is a dilemma. But it's the word that says, the structure of this essay, it's called bound to consciousness, is, oops, I'm going to have, this paper is going to be organized as a comparison contest. I'm going to compare omnivore against specialized eating. I'm going to contrast these. So you talk about the koala, the round thing, and then you get, but, contrast, but omnivores like us as opposed to the specialized eating, and then you get parallelism. Um, we rely on Phrygia's powers of memory. Our taste buds, too. Um, oh, that doesn't work quite. Um, what you're getting like is... All the way through, um, I, I've taken all of this and put, you know, the new information, the, the given information, the things that you've heard in the previous sentence, at the beginning of the sentence, it's in blue, at the end, it's the new information is in red. And in this passage, you can, I think, beautifully written piece. Um, I'm going to move fast since we only have 15 minutes and we're all tired. Um, any questions on what I'm doing? If I'm right, you were able to pick this out because you're smart and wonderful. And because this is a logical piece of writing. But there are, as you said, you knew the sentence, I have picked the title, I have picked his title because you knew that his referred back to something you had just learned, the guy's name. Every one of these sentences does that. Yeah. Go with the flow. Here. I have a surfboard. I spent a lot of time falling down, occasionally getting hit in the head with random stuff. So, to make your stuff coherent, I'm, I'll move fast. Um, if you think about audiences, it's like appeals. What do you appeal to? Audiences share things. And it's going to be, it's going to feel coherent if you talk to an audience and you think about these questions. What do they know? What are their purposes? know what reasons are included in the work. You can, thank you, uh, later in the semester we will talk about genre. Does anybody know what a genre is? Huh? Okay, movies, we talked about this a little bit. Yes, a genre is a kind or a category of thing. So genres tend to have rules and expectations. So we talked about resonance. You know what to look for. And it's coherent if you follow the pattern of expectation. Even an essay like Poland, there is a genre of um, journalistic writing about food that says you start with something big and fascinating, and then you provide some more information, you make a reference to an expert, you give them an example. It's coherent because it follows their expectations of your reader. The same is true of lab reports. We can look at a lawyer's summation of a case or pastor or priest or imam's sermon, and it's a genre. You know what to expect. And it holds together if you follow those expectations. Not boilerplate, but um, knock knock. You know what's coming next. When I, you know the knock knock joke. Um, you know, how many how many English professors does it take to screw in a light bulb? You know, you know the genres. You know what to expect. As long as I follow the expectation, it holds together. So if you're writing something that is a genre, you, know, you don't have to follow the other examples slavishly, but that gives you a kind of pattern. Your reader has a set of expectations that they get to follow you. Okay. Um, let's see. Yeah, I see. So I talked about the given new contrast. What that tells you, this is the principle for writing papers that flow. Whenever possible, put at the beginning of a sentence something you've already said, something you referred to, something you've applied, or that your audience already knows, something that is known or given. 
And at the end is where you give them the least predictable, the newest, the most important stuff. Um, that works with any paragraph. It works especially well with easy paragraphs. One of the problems you often get is you'll get people who will write a good paragraph, and they'll have like 10 good paragraphs, but there's no connection between them. It feels like 10 separate things. You need to reorder them and reorder, and it doesn't really matter. The best, you can't do it if you're not logical. But the best way to move from one, and this again, this is the other thing you can take from this exercise. The best way to move from one paragraph to a new paragraph is you leave this notion of given and new, and you start your second paragraph, the first sentence of that second paragraph. You start by referring to or restating or summarizing what you said in the previous paragraph. And then you add the new stuff to Usually you do it, uh, I'm going to be an English teacher when this, with a subordinate clause. So if I'm giving you a paragraph about the omnivores for lunch and I want to move to the next paragraph, I might say something like, while this dilemma about food is true in the animal world, it is equally true in the human world. And then I give you a paragraph about humans and the omnivores for lunch. But what I've done is I've started the sentence by saying, while, and then the clause. Despite the fact, while, while it's true in the animal world, comma, and I've just pointed back to that first paragraph, which is now given, known in your heads because you read it. Now I add what I'm going to talk about in this paragraph, the new information, a transition sentence between paragraphs that points back, summarizes, refers to the main point of what you just read as now given, and it introduces the new stuff. You'll be amazed. Professors will come to me and say, Tom, can you help me with this so that it'll flow? And you know, if I'm really being a jerk, I'll say, Yeah, I'll charge you hundred dollars an hour to do that. What's wrong with this idea? I take the given stuff and put it in the beginning of a sentence, and I write transitions between the paragraphs so that what they said in this paragraph is referred to, and they say, Oh wow, God, you're good. You can now do this. And this is an incredibly powerful, very simple tool. This is how you make your prose flow. Flow is easy. You can make this easy. Huh? Every sentence to link the new at the end of one as given at the end of the other. Now, having said that, this is not a rule. There is an exception to this. If you follow it absolutely slavishly, you're going to get boring, terrible prose. There are going to be places, and in the second paragraph here, he violates that and he says, he plays with it, he varies it. This is not something you have to do every time. It's like, have you ever read something where every sentence is a short declarative sentence that's six words long? Every sentence is short, the next sentence is short, and then you get a short sentence, and eventually it gets boring because the sentences are short, and my rhythm is bad, and, and your writing sounds like you've been driving down the highway at 60 miles an hour, unvarying your speed, and you can hear the bumps in the road. It's ba da 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 and you're asleep after the first paragraph, right? So this rule works. This strategy works. People, the way your brain works, you attach new information to old information. You can, he does this, you can vary this for effect. You don't have to follow it every <coughs> time. You know, use it, but use it frequently. Um, between paragraphs, not everybody does this. I don't even do it all the time, but in some cases, the more complicated my material is, the more complicated the concepts are, the newer all the stuff is, the more support I have to build around it. If you're in education, it's called scaffolding. If you're writing, we call it cue. The more, the denser, the newer, the more complicated the material is, the more you need to help your reader. So you need to use given new more, or you can do this. You can use prolepo. So if I start a sentence by saying, Furthermore, what do you know about 
what you're about to read. It's new. You're adding on to something. So you're not, you know that whatever comes after the word furthermore is going to be new, but it's going to reinforce, add on to, be more of the same. That is, um, so and if I say, however, um, you should use you should use given new all the time. However, it's not a hard and fast rule. If I use the how word, that's the simple. If I use the word however, you don't have to think about the content. You already know. I just held up a sign that says you have a contrast coming. You have a contradiction coming. The single word however tells your reader, don't focus on the content, but what you're going to get is a conflict, something different. Um, you know, you can do that with things that add, oppose, conclude, exemplify, intensify. Um, if it's really complicated, sequencing. You know, first, second, finally, in conclusion. These are very simple things. They are, but they are cues to tell your reader without having to think what the logical structure of the paragraph is or what the logical relationship between ideas is. And that makes it a whole lot easier for them to follow. Does that make some sense? It is eminently simple. Um, when I was a graduate student in Southern Spirit, one of my colleagues and I played a game on a couple of our friends' you know, writing classes. And we gave them a perfectly logical, coherent paragraphs and an incoherent one where it was just all over the map and made no sense at all. And we took all of the proleptics, the logical markers, out of them, a good logical piece of writing. And we just dumped them randomly into the crazy piece of writing. And we asked the students, which one makes more sense? And they all picked the one that was completely incoherent. It had all these nice words that said, therefore, logically, however, in conclusion, my third point is, they loved it. It was total garbage. But they loved it. He's don't, already, don't write total garbage. Yeah, don't write total garbage. <laughs> but, and, and not every sentence has to say, for example, therefore, you use these strategically. And all they are is like signposts you're driving down the, the highway, and it says, you know, Selman Expressway to St. Petersburg, turn the left. Otherwise, I get lost. These are just signposting cues that help your reader. They're immensely useful and powerful. And, um, you know, things that orient, you know, phrases at the beginning of sentences. Um, last thing I will say before I'm done. You can also use large structures, like the Poland piece is structured as comparison contrast. The omnivore, the specialized eater. The koala, the human and the rat. And once he said contrast, and he starts throwing in words like but, and by contrast, what he's doing is he's organizing all four of those paragraphs through that God help you in high school, write a comparison contrast paper. You learn that because that's a structure you have in your head. And as soon as he says contrast, and then three sentences later, you see a shift in the topic and but, oh, I get it. What I can eat and what I should eat. The omnivore, the specialized eater, is all through those first four paragraphs. And as you're reading, you're just thinking, oh, okay, he's contrasting one thing against another. Now I know what to look for and how the sentences. So you've got individual sentences, given and new, you've got the words, the proleptics that help you see that, and then you've got a text structure. And you can do you know, comparison, contrast, parallelism. Um, those structures make it immensely easier once somebody picks it up to understand the structure of your argument. These are not complicated things, but if you learn how to do the three or four things I've told you tonight, you really will. I mean, I can't make you a logical person, but it will make your writing close what you're saying. Damn, Pedro is a good writer. This this rocks, this flows. Follow. Absolutely. You have anticipated. Um, these are the things, especially uh, yeah, uh, I'm just going back to the beginning of the um, We talked about this now at the beginning of the Editing style here because all the way through this semester, certainly 
with your first accommodation. I want you doing this. I want you using the active voice and avoiding nominalization. I want we want you using given who, using instruction, using prolepsis in your first two assignments. In fact, you know, what are we looking for? And if, if you don't do it, if you want to do this, we're gonna wag a finger at you. And in your prose, I'm gonna say, look, you should have done this here. It will make it better. Remember that lecture? So yeah, this is stuff you need to put to work in your first assignments. And it really is that simple. I yeah. was working on a chapter from Mr. Davis uh, last semester, and I had a session, which is Carl's my cousin, and I had a session where I said, you know, I'm interested in teaching this section, but I need to figure out how to tie it together. And Carl said, you had a template, a boring template at the beginning that says, I'm going to take a quiz to prepare for this test. I want you to do the first one. He said, it's first. And then you say the thing. <laughs> And then when you start the second thing, you say, now that I've finished with the first thing, I'm now talking about the second thing. And that kind of quality that. thinking is why I get the big bucks. Yeah, no, exactly. And it was exactly what I needed. And the rest of the my committee members who wrote the chapter said, this is so well organized. It is so easy to follow. <laughs> so it really is that simple. And now we're done. Yes, now we're done. Yeah. I should get another five. We're yeah. done. Yeah.